So it's very important to explore many ways of being within different distances and spaces from other people and touched in different ways and not contextualizing it always in the same way. I can touch your chest uh, in one way, I can touch it with the exact same pressure and speed, but it will feel very different. The parameters, I'm not sure, certain intentions, certain combination of postures or ways, and this is beautiful exploration. And again, I would encourage you and others to explore the discomfort. For example, certain discomfort uh, to be uh, with a man in a certain scenario or with a woman and trying to see what is that. Because if we're truly strong, we truly know who we are and we are in that exploration. We don't know the end result, but we are in a research and then we are not afraid of being in that or this or we don't uh, come out of boundaries and this will improve our culture tremendously. Of course, there must be agreement. You never force yourself, but you need someone who is also interested in that exploration, and then you do it. Um, and uh, there right, are many anyway, scenarios to do that. That's my usual stretch routine, as usual. Like learning to grapple or... or Ask me anything, as always. Happy to answer questions. Anything to do with health-related stuff. There or fitness, the dance, anything. Latin dance class. Or, and there is, of course, my favorite is to create and to come up with your own hybrids of that and scenario. Communicating with your loved one through movement, not sitting around food and talking. Moving together in all kinds of ways. Sometimes it's walking together, but sometimes it's uh, all kinds of, it can be game, playful, it can be romantic, it, and there are many shades. Sex doesn't start here and end here, right? It's like a continuum, and we don't even need to define it in that way. So with time, I think, unlocks a lot of things. People become much stronger in a good sense, in sense of becoming, being, and uh, we abuse less, and we can approach... Uh, other aspects to us. I love the idea that through the exploration of a range of uh, physical contacts, provided one knows they can always return to their center, so to speak, then there's a lot of opportunity that opens up. I, d I wish there was more of that encouraged in um, children's play, but also, as you mentioned, in, in adult uh, environments, because um, yeah, nowadays, uh, for all sorts of reasons that you touched on, um, the idea of keeping at least an arm's length distance has become critical. There are a lot of environments actually where hugging is not allowed. Um, I don't know what it's like in Israel, but in the, in the States, many institutions, you're, you're not allowed to touch anyone else's body. There's actually a wonderful study that comes to mind from an Israeli laboratory, a guy named Noam Sobel, who's over there, um, who has shown that um, by recording people's first interactions, that when people meet, if they shake hands, they almost always, I think it's greater than 85% of the time, they will then wipe the chemicals from the other person onto their own eyes, typically their eyes or their face. Now this changed a little bit during the whole pandemic thing, but this is thought to be a uh, carryover from what other animals do in terms of exchanging microbiome elements, exchanging chemicals that we're constantly feeding our uh, subconscious with the uh, chemical, knowledge of the chemical constituents of other people, right? So it's, it goes way beyond how people smell, how they look, et cetera. More touch seems to me just, a, a, as you said, provided it's consensual, it seems like it's just a really good thing overall. And so I'm, uh, I think maybe also important for discharging, discharging certain experiences, remodeling, reframing, so it's like touches. It's very powerful in that if you're touched you're touching a lot, you're, you're unpacking, and you experience that touch that maybe has been traumatic, uh, and you're reframing it, you have the opportunity, um, which is something interesting. I, I've, I've heard some story about some traditional culture in which when you Remember were Remember that burned, you had to stretch for at least mistake, one minute they would every stretch you again. to have a biological change. Anything less Anything. just feels good, and, and then there would not be any that burn thing marks. That you've done and there would a minimum three the same something. side effects. One That's minute the claim. stretch, if you want to pop it a chain. It made me think, it's like, what's the source of this? And I, I realized that maybe it allows a certain 
completion to happen that in the traumatic moment is not there. So the re-exposure, while you're still open, the pores are still open, allows you to reframe the experience. And then the unfolding of the rest of the event is very different. This is if you're touching and you're practicing the day-to-day -day and you're working with people and you're being touched and people come closer or further away, it happens naturally. Um, yeah, and uh, if you pass a certain limit and it, it becomes uh, too much, uh, there is always, of course, communication that has to be present. Certain cultures make this communication pre, cer certain cultures post. The Israeli, for example, post, here, pre. Uh, so in Israel, they'll say, that didn't feel good to me, or that felt good, or that was fine? Yeah, it would be more common. Um, here in the airport, the guy's telling me, I'm going to slide my hands up towards your crotch until I need the hard stop. And, th and then he does this in a way that is supposed to show me I have no enjoyment in that. And for me, he just feels aggressive. But his, his, his intention is good, showing me. But if it was a loving touch, it would be nicer for me, actually. Personally, that's, mm -hmm. he would be gentle, but he goes up there and he shows me, I have no enjoyment in this. Fuck. Oh. That's my testicle right there. So it's, <laughs> it, 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 it's, a, it's different choices. I don't think it's like worse, or, but this description can be a bit dissociated. And what does it make me think? Is it truly what he feels or not? Because it feels robotic. So it's not. So sometimes I'd rather not say it. And uh, I'm going to touch your chest. And just place my hand on the chest. And uh, of course, we can't avoid the problem. I'm, I'm not suggesting that there is. But there is an examination. And because I moved around, uh, around the world, I've seen many things. And I've seen benefits here, benefits there. Um, and, and in the practice, I think it's important to discuss this, to examine this. I don't have a solution, but it's something to talk about. It is something to talk about, and I'm glad you raised it because I think that it's so clear to me that much of the value of a movement practice involves this dynamic interaction with somebody else. Well, as you pointed out, it can be performed on one's own and practiced throughout one's day, but the unpredictability is a key element to all of that, and bringing out all the the potential that, that you've described. Uh, at, in reference to the, this notion of trauma and, and burn and reburn, uh, my colleague at Stanford, David Spiegel, he um, works on trauma, and he's a, uh, has actually on this podcast, he voiced that he's against things like trigger warnings because of the way that it puts the nervous system into this state of readiness and reactivity that can exacerbate um, problems, whereas um, it's very clear from the literature on trauma and trauma relief that the way to deal with that is through a controlled, but clearly a controlled re-exposure to the trauma in order to diminish the emotional response over time. I think it's very clear. If we avoid the thing, obviously we don't want to re-injure ourselves or re-traumatize, but if one avoids the thing that makes them upset over and over, all it does is serve to create a heightened state of readiness. It primes more trauma. So I think it, it makes good sense. I think in impressions are very useful here also when stepping into an area in which trauma can occur. And then by going through the impression that it already occurred, you create some kind of a thermal layer of protection. Oh. And so I've already Hip been- flexes are the worst. When I'm entering that space. It's so beneficial. Well, once I get past so my hardest stretch, I've everything else is just easy. In a way that I didn't like. That's so one hip flexor. I like to double up and do this other running one. this scenario in, in your head, so well. Yeah. I'm glad you mentioned running scenarios in your head. I've just been curious all day as to whether or not you do visualization or mental rehearsal of physical movement. Um, this is a, it seems to be a popular idea in, in the States. People are always asking me, you know, if, can you just imagine a, a movement and learn it better than uh, were you to actually perform it? My, my hunch based on, and my understanding of the scientific literature is that visualization can be useful to some extent for people that are very good at visualization, but for many people it doesn't help. And that there's nothing like real physical practice to improve physical practice. Yeah, the word visualization is not good, obviously. Uh, it has to be experientialization uh, in a 
very complete way, not just visually. Um, and unless you already developed certain experience, tangible experience that has been be that has benefited from feedback from outside feedback, it is not a very useful thing to do, and it ends up uh, being uh, fabrications. But if you are very experienced and you already gained the benefit of being burnt here or overextended here then you have a certain experience and then you can strengthen certain aspects of it but you got to be careful because you do not have feedback and because of the missing feedback you might develop delusions it might be that you develop stronger patterning but ultimately this would lead you away from the aliveness remember each stretch has to be for one minute movement. anything less is dreaming useless. for example very useful learn a general infrastructure of the movement sleeve or the technique but then to dress it up you need feedback you need it to be alive you need to receive something corrective for many people they approach movement in the form of weight training or yoga or running um, yoga is a bit more about dynamic but it, fairly linear types of exercise and movement, uh, Peloton, rowing, these kinds of things. Um, I think most people will probably not depart from those practices entirely because they like them. I'm speaking about myself. I like some of those very much. I enjoy them. Um, but in terms of thinking about adding a movement practice to one's already existing exercise regime, um, I can imagine threading it throughout the day. I can imagine having a dedicated movement practice. One thing that I one more of a stretch I've lunge forward with on the this, basis of some of your pushing teachings, your hips uh, towards the ground. Just sort of the this heel idea is rather than statically as standing as you can and towards your butt. It's actually walking from as I alternate repetitions. It occurred to me that I'd never done uh, a curl, a bicep curl, with one foot in front of the other, and then I'd never actually switched that up. And it's a kind of an odd stance to be standing in parallel and curling one's arm. It's kind of a ridiculous movement when one thinks about it. So I started incorporating some of that. You get some strange looks in the gym, but I just get some strange looks back. So um, what are your thoughts about these very linear forms of exercise? And, um, and do you encourage people to expand the play space, um, as it were, for these kinds of exercise? Or do you think that movement practice is just best uh, explored through three-dimensionality, gravity, and maybe a sticker or a ball? It's definitely a problem, and it's a, it's approachable. People want a quick. Uh, people want a hack. People want the, the, the icing. And there is no cake. There's no cake, and, and it's just like industries of icing, icing, icing on what? What are you putting it on? So, for me, that that's why I'm I'm, I'm going towards this side. It's like I have my life. Now tell me what movement practices I should pursue. You are movement. In essence, you are not thinking of yourself in, a, in any serious way, in, through my eyes. There is a dynamic entity to you. The body is a huge part, it's a huge part of it, communicating. You have genetic layers. There is a personality that got developed and built around various influences. But then there is also some kind of an essence, something that reeks from within the cells and if you grew up in my family and I grew up in your family, it would still be the same. And that it's something that I always try to think about. What is that inside of me? Um, so I think these practices, they're very good, but they're not designed for the goal that we think they were designed to be. It orients towards something else. For example, yoga. There is a good book called The Yoga Body, uh, which will destroy a lot of people's yoga practice um, and it goes into how did we get to this yoga the influence of Swedish gymnastics and Mongolian contortionists and the western the west affecting it and then the ancient practice which was really asana related I think the variation that I do on the chair so probably gets me more of a yoga stretch is just linear. Yoga this is probably is the last linear. one I do the floor ones very linear these days, these lines. Look at all the traditional dances. They look like nothing like yoga. Look at Thai dance. 
to the Chinese dances, martial arts. It's all rounded, it's all curved. It's like the, like out nature, what you see in nature, and the movement of the animals. So, where does it come from? These are things to understand because it designs you now. It, it shapes you. You're placing yourself in these forces of change and these streams of change. And you have a good intention and you just want this or that, but the joke is on us. And this is the movement practice for me is first education. Start to think about this. I have nothing that I can just sprinkle now, some magic powder that will help resolve this because it's a start of a deep investigation. And then some of the things, let's talk pragmatically because what you describe is not about you placing the foot in front when you're curling. It's about the examination. This is why it, it is a very good direction. And then you will need another one, another one. Don't get stuck on that foot in front, but and try to do with the eyes closed or with a different head posture, and you will see things arrive. Unrelated things, because the associative mind thinking this relates to this doesn't get to the heart of it, never. So just infusing these elements like in a cup will create endless combinations, possibilities, and a lot of discovery. And this for me is humility of the practitioner. I don't know. I One way to do it, Dr. Like today with you, I tried various combinations. Slash and oh, I discovered something. Oh, this, this is a playful approach, and this is a researcher approach. The more you can push down um, on your knees, I the better. Try to fit together, my truth simple. into something. I'm, I'm there to examine. I don't have a motive yet. Why? Because I'm fine. I don't depend on that to define myself. I'm a human being. Oh but, but if I don't have that sense of worth, I. I'm already like geared towards, I need to do this, I need to prove this, I have this agenda. And this is how we get all the lies in the world and all the, the problems and difficulties. So these practices, they are related to it, to prove this, that, this way, and why we need muscles for X, Y, Z. And a lot of the reported outcomes are often from my place, it's like funny. I hear about something like I, I heard you say about gratitude practice that uh, actually experiencing you know, outside as if somebody else or you are receiving gratitude is actually more powerful. It's true, but I see why it's true. I'm, I'm not sure everybody sees it. If somebody tries to feel gratitude, just sit with the eyes closed. Remember to breathe through your stretches. Watch a movie and sense the it's very easy to tense up. One is very difficult to do. And the other is very easy. Another variation and for a doctor is just is simple, simple easier as this. this way. That's why see how far wide you can go. Although all the traditional practices... But I feel like the one that I do on the floor works my doctors a lot better. This is just a to sense that goal, hoping yourself. that maybe I get to the splits in about six months. Thing, but this is not the research people, uh, the, the people in the research. We don't have a lot of those people. So a lot of the things that are can arrive to us, weight training, the benefits, uh, or the way that... Uh, the hormonal effects, uh, the effect over cognition, etc. I, when you open a bit and you go far out, you see certain things. Not the truth, but maybe less delusion. Okay, there is no, nothing definite, but there is there is something maybe more wholesome that appears. Um, yeah, and I think this is. So th this is a state, a state of exploration. And I don't want to have the same thought if I already had it. Why would I want to have the same thought? I already had it. I don't want to have the same practice. I don't want to. I curled already in this way. I want to experience something else. I want to. There is a better. Normally, I'd have my chair in no, front of me to lift myself better. back up. Uh, this one to do. Is better, not more. Take it slow, no quick movements. Yes. Easier to injure yourself. Just better take your time with it. Right, next and one is hamstring. We don't know what better is, right? So it's like it's open. Oh, this is better. I don't know. It's just more weight. It's one more kilo. But maybe if I remove one kilo, I discover something. Like for example, power development has been shown to 
gain certain benefits when you lighten the load and you accelerate it more in certain conditions. But who discovered it? A practitioner, a math person, uh, not Verkoshensky, Zatsiorsky. They reported something, but it was already within the grasp of the practitioners. And I think, um, and as a, as a researcher, this is very powerful remind yourself this and to work with that and as a practitioner as a living human being for everyone i think something very useful and then those plays that you're doing uh, it uh, people give you this the weird looks and it's like yeah i tell people you don't want to be normal you don't get the weird looks you're not moving in the right direction you're moving in and in a very fixed and uh, you already know the result of that direction let's say at least that so continue to play with that uh, continue to play look elsewhere look at places you didn't look at because this is still like within the same layer one foot in front one foot, one foot behind what happens when you do it with a smile the same workout and when you do it with a frown or what happened breath holding or blood restriction all this it's great play and I think very beneficial to do to go through. I think it's a wonderful message. Uh, what I keep hearing from you over and over again is to that people should explore, explore, explore. And um, listen, I, I want to thank you for your time today, first of all, um, for the incredible teachings here at this table, but also the introduction to a, a movement practice. Although now I'm tempted to say that I've been moving my whole life. I've just That's didn't true. know I was, that it was such a vast landscape. Um, uh, also that your willingness to tread out in this uh, journey that is truly unique. You know, that the greatest compliment that one can give in science is the one that I'm gonna tell you now because it's entirely appropriate, which is we say you're an N of one, right? That, that, and you truly are. I don't think there's anyone that has been as willing to embrace existing practices, evolve them, create new practices, and and um, and to share so broadly, to really be willing to give and teach so much knowledge. You know, earlier, you made the mention of your your goals of, uh, in part, of being wild and wise, and I'm here to tell you that you are both wild and wise. And so, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you for joining me today for my discussion about the science and practice of movement and movement culture with Ido Portal. If you'd like to learn more about Ido and his workshops and... Just gonna play something else for a second, listen to the background. Surprisingly enough, he's got a podcast. This is Andrew Huberman, by the way, an amazing neuroscientist. Let's see, one about... There's actually one about flexibility, which is perfect for me. I need to learn more about it. Flexibility. Welcome to the Huberman Lab podcast. And we, in doing that, you would find quality blood test with mechanism of making sure that you don't overload muscles for more than six months now, and I can confidently say that there are four different like to just highlight some of the features that are already built into your nervous system and in Huberman and use the code Huberman at checkout for 10% off your first order. Um, Let's talk cut. about flexibility and stretching. Before we talk about the practices of flexibility and stretching, I'd like to just highlight some of the features that are already built into your nervous system and into your body that allow you to be flexible. Some of us feel tighter than others, sometimes in specific limbs or areas of our body. Some people feel really loose and limber. Some people even have what's called a hyperflexibility. They, for instance, have a relative that can take her fingers and bend them back to the point where they touch her wrist. And it always uh, you know, makes me cringe a little bit, but she can do that without any pain. She seems to have some hyperflexibility in her joints. I do not have that feature. Some of you may find that you are more flexible than others naturally. And some of you might be thinking, you don't need to build in additional flexibility. Well, I think by the end of today's episode, you'll realize that almost all of us can benefit from having some sort of understanding about flexibility and having some stretching protocol that we incorporate into our life, if not just for physical performance reasons, for postural reasons, 
but also for cognitive and mental reasons. Be sure to clarify what all of that means. Right now, I'd like to take a moment and just highlight the flexibility that you already have. For instance, if you were to move your arm behind your torso a little bit and then sort of let go or stop exerting any effort in doing that, you would find that the limb would return more or less to a position next to your torso. At least I would hope so. And why is that? Well, it turns out that there are aspects of your nervous system, aspects of your skeletal system, aspects of your muscles, and aspects of the connective tissue that binds all of that together that try and restore a particular order or position to your limbs and your limbs relative to one another. So that reflects a very specific set of processes that it turns out are the same set of processes that you use when you are trying to enhance flexibility and stretching. I'd like to just take a moment and review the basic elements of nervous system, muscle, connective tissue, and skeletal tissue, bone, that allow for flexibility and stretching. And here we can point to two major mechanisms by which your nervous system, neurons, meaning nerve cells, communicate with muscles, and those muscles communicate back to your nervous system to make sure that your limbs don't stretch too far, they don't move too far, such that you get injured. And in addition to that, mechanisms that ensure that you don't overload your muscles too much with weight or with tension or with effort and damage them that way. Because it turns out that the second security mechanism of making sure that you don't overload muscles can be leveraged toward increasing your flexibility almost immediately. That's right, there are protocols and tools that I'll share with you that are going to allow you to vastly improve your flexibility right. Those are carbs. over time. The one that I but showed there are also just mechanisms for that allow you to quite significantly you keep increase the back leg your straight, flexibility you're working, you're stretching in gastros. a very Once short you bend that knee, you're you working just a few seconds. So let's establish some so of the soleus, basic gastro. biological mechanisms. Anytime we talk about biology or physiology, we're gonna talk about structure, meaning the cells and their connections, and function, what they do. Just a few names to understand. You do not have to memorize these names. The important thing that I'd like you to know is that flexibility and the process of stretching and getting more flexible involves three major components. Neural, meaning of the nervous system, muscular, muscles, and connective tissue. Connective tissue is the stuff that surrounds the neural stuff and the muscular stuff, although it's all kind of weaved together and braided together in complicated ways. Some of you may have heard of fascia. We're gonna talk a little bit about fascia today, although it's such an interesting tissue that it's really deserving of its own episode. Fascial tissue, fascia we're gonna talk about some of the stuff that surrounds muscles like that really the gives you your shape and holds all everything of our muscles together, together and allows for flexibility it's the whole, to occur. Everything's connected. Here's a key thing that everyone should know, whether or not you're talking about flexibility or not. Your nervous system controls your muscles. It's what gets your muscles to contract. Within your spinal cord, you have a category of neurons, nerve cells, that are called motor neurons. To be precise, they are lower motor neurons because they're in your spinal cord. We call them lower to distinguish them from the motor neurons. The main thing about this stretch is trying to keep your knees as straight as you can. Those I'm pretty sure lower they're motor neurons, camera, but hereafter, I'll be able to check it later. them as motor neurons. If I want to talk about the other kind of motor neurons, I'll say upper motor neurons. So if I say motor neurons, I just mean the ones in your spinal cord. Those motor neurons send a little wire or set of wires out to your muscles. And that creates what's called a neuromuscular junction. It just means that the neurons meet the muscles at a particular place. Those neurons release a chemical. That chemical is called acetylcholine. Some of you may have heard about acetylcholine before. Acetylcholine also exists in your brain and does other things in your brain, mainly it's involved in focus and attention. But at the neuromuscular junction, the release of acetylcholine from these nerve cells, these neurons, onto the muscles causes the muscles to contract. When muscles contract, they are able to move limbs by way of changing the length of the muscle, well, I tried. adjusting the function of connective tissue. My goal for that one is hopefully to eventually get my hands, both palms of my hands on the bottom. You're bringing on your the wrist floor. closer to your shoulder. That biceps muscle is contracting, it's getting shorter. Okay. In reality, it hasn't gotten shorter overall. So that's just the lower limbs pretty shorter, much. Of course. Uh, All of that is controlled by neurons. And it's those motor neurons from the spinal cord yeah, that are really limbs. responsible for the major movement of your limb. All right, the next set I tend to just do 
on my chair. So remember how I said before, if I was feeling lazy, I just didn't feel like stretching. Half my routine is on my chair. So while I'm just sitting here and I'm just watching stuff in general. This by way of causing contraction of specific muscles at specific times. So the key thing to take away is that nerve controls the contraction of muscles. Now, within the muscles themselves, there are nerve connections. And these are nerve connections that arise from a different set of neurons in the spinal cord that we call sensory neurons. The sensory neurons exist in a different part of the spinal cord, and they send a little wire or set of wires into the muscles. And there's a particular kind of sensory neuron that comes out of your spinal cord and into your muscles, which are called spindle neurons. They create or they actually wrap around muscle fibers, corkscrew around them, they give it kind of a spring-like appearance. If for you aficionados out there, these are intrafusal connections or neurons. Intrafusal means within the muscle, but you really don't need to know that unless you're really curious about it or you're going to become a neuroscientist or you're in medical school or something. These spindle connections within the muscle that wrap around the muscle fibers sense the stretch of those muscle fibers. So now we have two parts to the system that I've described. We've got motor neurons that can cause muscles to contract and shorten, and we have these spindles within the muscles themselves. What's so cool about what he's talking about is like when it comes to balance within our own systems, we have different mechanisms that are at work. You've got your cochlear ear, so that sort of proprioception, um, knowing where your body's in space. You have a positional as well, how you feel when you're on the ground or when you sit it down. But what's cool as well about what he's talking about is our muscles. Depending on what length our muscles are at that time, our body knows in our, in, in our brains that it knows what position we're in. It's so cool. But that's also one reason why some people get headaches. So a big one is um, cervicogenic headaches. And essentially, um, we get headaches, we get dizziness, we get vertigo. It's when these systems, they sort of, something's not right. Like um, the connections that the, the, the information is bringing to our brains. One saying one thing, the other saying something else. Our visual one's a big one. So that's why, you know, for example, if you spin around real quickly, the, uh, the copy is in your ear when you've got the, the little crystals within there, let you know where you are positioned. It's telling you one thing. It thinks you're still spinning, but then your eyes are telling you, wait, I'm not really spinning. So when you stop, the eyes are like, no, you're standing straight. But the thing that in your head is like, no, you're still spinning. And that's when things get a bit dizzy and whatnot. It's when those things sort of cross and information that you get across. Uh, I'll just try to get through this real quick. But muscles are the same. If our muscles are at different lengths that they're not usually at, um, it, our body thinks, oh, because my muscle is more lengthened and it's here, um, the brain now thinks, oh, it, my head position must be here if my muscle is that length, but really it's back up here. So little things like that, little cross connections are just the misfiring of the wiring, but anyway. That wrap around the muscle fibers, and that information is sent from the muscle back to the spinal cord. It's a uh, there's this awesome experiment that we did in uh, uni, in where much of the uh, same you way stand that you there, I think the eyes closed, eye and then you get this vibrating machine. It's like a massager, and you put it on your calves. In your external now, by doing that, I think it relaxes the muscles that are sensory, and it makes your mind think the amount of stretch that. In it's more contracted, so technically what happens is you're if going backwards, and what your brain does, really it forces you to just move forward. Those sensory neurons, trying to those counteract that. within the muscle, right. will activate. Yeah. And we're we're such complex systems, but at the same time, we're just so easily a bit of electricity along that wire's length into the spinal cord, and then within the spinal cord, that sensory neuron communicates through a series of intermediate steps, but to the motor neuron and make sure that that motor neuron contracts. Why would that be useful? Well, what this does is it creates a situation where if a muscle is, or is stretching too much because the range of motion of a limb is increased too much, then the muscle will contract to bring that limb range of motion into a, a safe range again. What determines whether or not a range of motion is quote unquote safe or not is dictated by a number of things dictated by things that are happening in this kind of loop so cool. of our bodies are such amazing spinal cord machines muscle. it's also at the same time by yeah, what's going on stuff in up your so head, literally so mind, cognitively about whether or not the movement well. of that, that limb 
it's an increasing range of motion is good for you. So like I said last time, with biceps. Whether or not it's bad for you. And then there are also some basic safety mechanisms that are um, put in there that really try and restrict our, our biceps. Motion. Okay, flex so just to clarify, this whole thing looks like shoulders. a loop. So and the essential components of the loop are either. motor neurons, contract muscles, and extend our shoulders. Sensory so neurons, this, of which uh, there are a bunch of different varieties, and in this case, what we call the spindles, are so sensory stretch within the muscles. And if shoulder, a given flex, muscle elbow, is extended, elongating as far as because of the increased range of motion of a limb, those sensory neurons send an electrical signal into the spinal cord such that there is an activation of the motor neuron, which by now should make perfect sense as to why that's useful. It then shortens up the muscle. It actually doesn't really shorten the muscle, but contracts the muscle that brings the limb back into a safe range of motion. Okay, So this process is very fast. It was designed to keep your body together and safe. It's designed to make sure that you don't, you know, take your arm and swing it behind your torso and it just goes all the way back to the middle of your back. I mean, unless you're a contortionist or you've trained that kind of level of flexibility, that would be terrible because it could provide a lot of damage to the muscles and, and the connective tissue and so forth. So that's one basic being mechanism too flexible that is a thing. Hold being too flexible This idea of a, a spindle that senses stretch and can activate contraction of the muscles and shorten the muscles. The next mechanism I want to describe, and once again, there are only two that you need to hold in mind for this episode. This other mechanism has a lot of the same features as the one I just described, but it has less to do with stretch. In fact, it doesn't have to do with stretch as much as it has to do with sensing loads. So at the end of each muscle, you have tendons typically and there are neurons that are closely associated with those tendons that are called Golgi tendon organs right these are neurons that are sensory neurons that sense how much load is on a given muscle right so if you're lifting up something very very heavy these neurons are going to fire meaning they're going to send electrical activity into the spinal cord and then those neurons have the ability to shut down not activate, but shut down motor neurons and to prevent the contraction of a given muscle. So for instance, if you were to walk over and try and pick up a weight that is much too heavy for you, meaning you could not do it without injuring yourself, and you start to try and heave that weight off the ground, there are a number of reasons why you might not be able to lift it, but let's say you start to get it a little bit off the ground or you start to get some force generated that would allow it to move, but the force that you're generating could potentially rip your muscles or your tendons off of the bone, right? That it could disrupt the joints, it could tear ligaments. Well, you have a safety mechanism in place. It's these Golgi tendon organs, these GTOs as they're called, that get activated and shut down the motor neurons and make it impossible for those muscles to contract. Okay, so on the one hand, we have a mechanism that senses stretch and can figure out when stretch is excessive and when this system detects that stress is excessive, it activates the contraction of muscles. And then we have a second mechanism that senses loads. And when tension or loads is deemed excessive by these circuits, and remember, these circuits don't have a mind. They don't go, oh, this is excessive. They just sense loads. And when those loads exceed a certain threshold, well, then those GTOs, those Golgi tendon organs, send signals into the spinal cord that shut down your motor neurons ability to contract muscles so that you no longer can lift that heavy load. So both of these are protective mechanisms, but both of these can be leveraged in a very logical way and in a very safe way in order to increase your limb range of motion. There are a couple of things I want to point out before going a little bit further into how your nervous system controls flexibility and stretching. And those key points are the following. There are now dozens, if not hundreds of studies that show that a dedicated stretching practice can improve limb range of motion. Now, for many of you listening, you're probably saying, duh, but <laughs> I think it's important to point that out, that a dedicated stretching practice can increase limb range of motion. Well, here's hoping. As you'll soon learn, there are specific mechanisms that can explain that effect. The second point is one of longevity. And when I say longevity, I don't necessarily mean late stage aging. We all undergo a decrease in limb range of motion unless we do something to offset that decrease. And the current numbers vary from study to study, but if you look in mass, you look at all of those studies, and what you basically find is that 
we start to experience a decrease in flexibility from about age 20 uh, it ain't been until popping. about They're age just 49 that's muscle creases dramatic. how are you going then, slide course, check how are you going tonight after well, i'm not sure where you are but it's 10 but this it's I a 10 percent decrease every 10 uh. years so we could say it's a one percent decrease per year although it's not necessarily linear what do i mean by that well it's not necessarily that on your 21st birthday you are one percent less flexible than you were on your 20th birthday and it decreases by one percent per year some of these changes can be non-linear so you can imagine the person who's doing just fine in terms of flexibility all i'm doing is 30 this, and then pulling my thumb you know, back they towards get my to wrist. 32 and suddenly they've lost but i do it with the tables because now of course there will be like, i'm lazy and, and i like to be efficient if you're regular if i don't work more yoga, than one one stretch at a time practice, if you're doing other things to improve your muscle contractibility so you're doing resistance training it turns out can actually indirectly improve flexibility there are a number of different factors but the key point is that maintaining some degree of flexibility and maybe even enhancing <laughs> hey, range of motion if that's the next level of my training that i gotta get to benefit that's what i gotta get to injury provided it's not pushed too far there are a number of people who have pushed their limb range of motion well, finger so push-ups aren't well that they i can actually do finger push-ups now injuries, both acute how many fingers injuries. that's the they challenge also talk about how to avoid those scenarios okay so we've established that there are mechanisms within the spinal cord muscles and connective tissue those Remember, it's the motor neurons, the spindles, the GTOs, and of course the muscles themselves and connective yeah, I'm gonna tissue. Have to listen to this whole tendons, podcast but also again. other forms of connective tissue that establish whether or not a limb is going to stay within a particular range of motion or not, and whether or not a limb is going to oh, for sure. be allowed by well, the system. It's all levels, slide check. It's all levels. Handle a given load, um, given tension. I just have to do one finger push-up compared to, I don't know, that a deadlift of 200, 300 kilos. System, I'd rather the finger push-ups. higher up in the nervous system, from the brain. And those mechanisms involve a couple of different facets that are really interesting and I think that we should all know about. In fact, today I'm going to teach you about a set of neurons that I'm guessing 99% so of you have never heard of. If you want to accentuate it, you neuroscientists out there, um, out there, don't just use your hands to pull there. this way. But also seem concentrate on this elbow going down. Enriched in so you're stretching for both ends. Probably perform essential roles in our ability to regulate our physiology and our emotional state. So within the brain, we have the ability to sense things in the external world, something we call exteroception, and we have the ability to sense things in our internal oh, no, I didn't look at the time. Our body, oh, okay. Interoception. Interoception can say be 50 the volume now. of food in your gut whether or not you're experiencing any organ pain or discomfort, whether or not you feel good in your gut and in your organs. That's actually, you know, kind of feeling, mm, I feel great, I feel sated, I feel relaxed. But those are all different forms of interoception. The main brain area that's associated with interpreting what's going on in our body is called the insula, I-N-S-U-L-A. It's a very interesting brain region. It's got two major parts. The front of it is mainly concerned with things like smell and to some extent vision and to some extent other things that are arriving from the external world and combining with what's going on internally and making sense of that uh, of all that or at least routing that information elsewhere in your nervous system to make decisions like if you smell something good to approach it or if you smell something bad to avoid it the front of the insula is really doing all of that kind of stuff along with other brain areas posterior insula the back of the insula that is has a very interesting and distinct set of functions. The posterior insula is you mainly play around with concerned with what's going down. on See with your the somatic experience. How do you feel internally and how is the movement that you happen to be doing combining with your internal state to allow you to feel, as I always like to say, the nervous system mainly batches things into yum, like, oh, this is really good for me, Yuck, this is really bad for me, and I need to stop, or meh, this is kind of neutral. Okay, so this isn't about food, but we could say for most stimuli, most senses, whether or not they're senses of things internally or externally, our nervous system is trying to make decisions about what to do with that information, and so it mainly batches information into yum, I want to keep doing this or approach this thing, or continue down some path of movement or eating or staying in a temperature environment, etc., or yuck, I need to get out of here, I don't want any more of this, I don't want to keep doing this, this is painful or aversive or stressful, and then meh, well, if it doesn't really matter, I can just kind of stay okay. here. Okay, um, yuck, and well, and in done, your lower limbs, posterior done, insula, neck, done. you have a very interesting population, very missing? large neurons. Right, I guess These the last variation of the... Large neurons, uh, called 
Van Economo. Glutes. These are I feel these are more better if you do it in a chair scientists. and they seem compared to when I do it on the ground. In so one humans. foot over the other knee, chimpanzees and lean forward. And some other remember, large your hinges have them. So from your found hips. In whales, huge. chimpanzees, Don't elephants, your and back. humans. Because but even though we are much smaller back, than hinge from whales, your hips. and even though we are so much smaller the back than most elephants, and remember there are baby and elephants. Give you more as far as I know, they haven't bred up um, like like mini elephants yet. They seem to have a, a, a teacup version of pretty much every dog breed. Um, look that up. I don't. I certainly have mixed feelings about this notion of, of trying to downsize everything to the point where you can kind of like the pocket-sized bulldog I think will someday will arrive. I'm not a fan of that kind of downsizing of, of different breeds. But because there aren't teacup elephants and teacup gorillas and teacup chimpanzees and so forth, most all of those other species are larger than us. They have these van economo neurons, and we have these van economo neurons, but we have in upwards of 80,000 of these things in our posterior insula. These other species tend to have somewhere in the range of 1,000 to maybe 10,000 or so. Why is that interesting? Well, these van economo neurons have the unique property of integrating our knowledge about our body movements, our sense of pain and discomfort, and can drive motivational processes that allow us to lean into discomfort and indeed to overcome any discomfort if we decide that the discomfort oh, that we are experiencing is good for us or directed toward a specific goal. This knowledge turns out to be very important to keep in mind. Whenever you do stretches around your legs, this conversation your back, the things that we make sure they hinge from the flexibility and stretching, you'll soon That's learn you that there are the moments more. within a stretching protocol where you have the opportunity to either override pain and discomfort, yep. to kind of relax through it or push through it. Yeah. Breathe, decision, relax, fork in the road it. there. I'll you don't want you to tense through it. Take. You want to just... Or to say, uh-uh, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to allow these natural reflexes of the spindle to kick in and just essentially stop me from stretching if a given limb isn't designed or shouldn't be stretched that far. So I'd like you to keep these van Very normal to have pain. Mind. Well, not pain, discomfort during stretch. I should mention just find your because the guy five out of ten pain. Economo, the discovery of discomfort. The end of the Anything more than that? Pull 1800s, it back. early 1900s. Decided to name them after himself, as many scientists. So, so discomfort do, is where you discover new neurologists and, and physicians are famous for naming where you things get after past. themselves. These van economo neurons turn out to be very important to keep in mind so as we embark oh, okay, on exploration uh, of what one. sorts of I forgot stretching to do. practices. Oh, it's going to look weird, but anyway, I showed on the last one. But essentially, because again, it's another one that I do when I sit down. A Elbows on the table. Mild, moderate, I slowly push the chair back. Flexibility training. So my arms are sort of going up like no this. Doubt encounter a scenario and then I'm pushing my chest towards the ground. You will what this helps with do I, quote unquote, relax is it's a good stretch. stretch? Or our or do thoracic I spine, push through like sort of just a little bit of this part of our spine here. I'll That's our cervical, to thoracic, that lumbers our lower back. So it's this mid spine part. Ideally safe Great for desk workers and whatnot, anyone in general. Because most people have this um, that best sort of preserves the integrity of those neural circuits that I described earlier. Over. And keep you safe. Uh, do you want to These van economo neurons open that up. sit in the so a stretch that I give my patients is to be able to evaluate what's going on in the body. Push your chest particular what's going on in terms but of I like this one more because I don't want to stretch through my arms as well. Discomfort. And then there's the other aspect of it. It's going to look weird because you're just going to see the top of my head. That these van economo neurons are connected to a number of different brain areas. But I keep pushing the chair back. shift our internal state. Whereas I can. So called sympathetic and activation. I push my so chest down towards the floor. Alertness and even stress. That flattens out the back. Panic, but typically alertness and stress to one of so-called parasympathetic activation. Did you have like sort of bit of that hump, that kyphosis through your upper back? This Oftentimes you hear that stretching should be done by relaxing into the stretch. But what does it actually mean to relax into the stretch? Well, these van economo neurons sit at this junction where they're able to evaluate what's going on inside our body and allow us to access neural circuitries by which we can shift our relative level of alertness down a bit or our relative level of stress down a bit, and thereby to increase so-called parasympathetic activation and to literally override some of those spindle mechanisms, even the GTO mechanisms, but especially the spindle mechanisms at the neuromuscular and musculospinal junction. And in that way, 
gently, subtly override the reflex that would otherwise cause us to contract those muscles back. The reason that's possible is because your brain has those other kinds of motor neurons, the upper motor neurons that can both direct, meaning control, and can override lower That's motor essentially neurons. it for that one. I'll give you a brief example of this that oh, you've sorry. already done in your life and that we all have the capacity for. What I'm referring to that is the monosynaptic stretch reflex. Um, this is something that every... Yeah, that's essentially it, I think. That's the whole routine. And like I said, the top half, the first half of my routine is the upper body, and I do it all in my chair because uh, I like to watch stuff. I like to play stuff while I do my stretches because stretching is boring. Stretching sucks. But if you can find anything that keeps you consistent and that gets you doing it, sweet. Go, go right ahead because, yeah... I've been lazy definitely for my first 15 years of working out, uh, especially when it comes to my uh, flexibility. But the, how do I say, the response time that you get, if you keep consistent every single day, uh, you get the benefits. I felt the benefits probably soon after three days in a row. I was moving without feeling impeded within my movements, which is nice. It's nice to be able to move and turn however I want without worrying about my body going, oh, oh shit, this is wrong. Because that's how a lot of my patients come in and see me. It's not because, yeah, there are accidents, those things happen, but most of the time it'll be the thing that you do every day, that one day there'll be this one moment where something can go wrong, it just goes wrong, because it's just natural. Uh, unless you're keeping healthy and whatnot, it's just natural, even if you are, it, wear and tear is normal. Even after a period of time, even for me, there'll be, there will be a time where there'll be enough wear and tear within me where something that I do normally every day, it, it'll just get me. It might be just picking something off the ground, tying my shoes, putting a shirt on, coughing <laughs> i did my neck once just from drying my hair too quickly it's just in that one moment something can go wrong but yeah so with what stretches do it allows me to move through these ranges uh more freely i guess so i'm just messing with my hair a bit too much but anyway um and yeah and if you are lazy like me um uh, like i said just like my workouts just get started uh and how i get started with my stretches i start in the chair once I get halfway through, that's half my body done. Then I want to do the rest of it. Then I get up and then I do all the rest of my lower body. But yeah, anyway, that's it for today. I will be working out tomorrow morning, hopefully, depending on what time my boss messages me. He does, he does that. He messages me to let me know like the night before because it depends on the schedule. It changes throughout the day. Uh, tomorrow will be my usual, my much harder routine. Weighted pull-ups, Russian twists. I'll probably do the trap bar for my back. Oh, I did back on Wednesday, though. I don't like doing too much back because you really don't need to unless you're competing I always say that work out risk free unless you're competing unless like, if, if, if you're competing you need to take risks but if you're not competing what, what's the point why take a risk why put yourself in that danger and then next thing you're out for two weeks so, some of us need to work some of us need to go on with our lives so you know build it up slowly but, um, make sure it's safe of course proper technique is always crucial anyway see you guys tomorrow morning take care thanks for jumping in